The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the book of the prophet Jeremiah, in chapter 9, reading verses 23 and 24. The book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 9, reading verses 23 and 24. Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise men glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty men glory in his might, let not the rich men glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Now I call your attention to these words, these striking and momentous words uttered by the prophet Jeremiah as the mouthpiece of God. In order that we may consider together the whole problem of life and of living. That is the business of a service such as this. This is not uh, just some kind of society where men and women at their leisure and out of some general interest meet together to consider certain subjects and questions. That's not the position. The whole purpose of a meeting such as this is that we may consider together the whole problem of life and of living. This is always something that's necessary. But in days and times like these, with the world as it is, it is more necessary than ever. Now, we began doing this very thing last uh, Sunday night. Surely this is the thing which, to which we must give ourselves. I say with a new urgency at a critical and a difficult moment like this. Because it's obvious that there's something tragically wrong with men and with the world as a whole. And the business of this book called the Bible is to bring us to see the cause of that trouble. And then to lead us to the only solution to the problem. Now, there are many different ways in which man shows this tragic condition in which he is to be found. Last Sunday night, we were looking at the case of people who just contract out of life altogether, or at least who think that they can do so. We were looking at that incident in the 18th chapter of the book of Judges, where we read a story about those Zidonians who went off on their own to build a sort of dream city where there was no law, no magistrate, no hindrances and encumbrances of that type and kind, and who thought fondly that they'd really made a perfect well for themselves, but suddenly found that it all went and vanished, and they themselves with it. Now that was a picture of so many modern men and women who think that they can contract out of life, not really face it at all, but just have their supposed good time make this little world for themselves. Well, we saw, I think, clearly and plainly what a ridiculous, what a futile attitude that is. But it isn't the only one. It isn't the only fallacy with respect to life that is being manifested at this present time. Now, here in this little paragraph that we're looking at together here in the ninth chapter of the book of the prophet Jeremiah, in just two verses, we are given another picture of another group of people, another type of person who would have ridiculed the matter that we were looking at last Sunday night and would have said that that was patently wrong and obviously quite ridiculous. But though they can see through the fallacy of that, they cannot see that they're in an equally fallacious position. But here the prophet, I say, as the mouthpiece of God, calls them to realize the futility of their position and of what they are doing. Now, what was their fallacy? Well, here you see the fallacy is a different one. Here it is this extraordinary fallacy 
of turning to and confiding in false expedients and solutions. The people we looked at last Sunday night were not interested in solutions at all. They just didn't think. They just went off to have their good time. Here we are dealing with people who do think, but who've come to the wrong conclusion. And are putting their confidence and their faith, I say, in false expedients and solutions to the problem and the battle of life. Now, again, we must note this point in passing. There's nothing new here, is there? This prophet Jeremiah wrote about eight centuries before the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But you notice the things against which he had to warn his contemporaries. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty men glory in his might. Let not the rich men glory in his riches. Now that was necessary as a message all that long time ago. Very nearly 28 centuries. And yet, you see, it's as necessary tonight as it was then. For these are the very things to which the modern man is turning and, and on which he relies. I've got to make this point. It's a fundamental one in biblical teaching. Man does not change at all. Human nature is tonight what it was in the days of Jeremiah, what it has always been ever since the fall of men from the very dawn of history. Man doesn't change. There he was then, trusting to these three things. He's trusting to the same three things even at this very moment. Man doesn't change, but thank God the message doesn't change either. And of course it doesn't need to. As the problem of man is the same, so he needs the same message. And the message of God in this old book is as up-to-date and as relevant this evening as it was so many long centuries ago. Very well, then. Let's look together at what the prophet has to say to his contemporaries. They were in trouble as we are in trouble. Their whole world had become very insecure. Things had gone wrong in Israel in every respect, not only religiously, but morally particularly, and even in a military sense. The Chaldeans were gathering together a great army and were on the point of attacking Jerusalem. The position was terribly uncertain. At any moment, the enemy might come, and eventually, of course, he did come, because they wouldn't listen to the warning of the prophets. Well, very well, there is their position. Why are they in that position? The prophet tells them. And I'm here to suggest to you that it is the same message precisely that is needed by this world tonight, whether in general or in particular. It is a message that comes to every individual in the world at this moment. So let me put the question. Why is the world in trouble? What is the cause of this human tragedy that is so obvious in the world at this moment? I'm not only thinking of the international tension and all the terrible possibilities that are there. I'm thinking of it as it's manifesting itself in the social life of the people in every country. All the trouble and the anguish and the pain and the confusion. What is the cause of it all? Why is the world tonight so tense, feeling this awful strain, fearful, knowing not what's going to happen? Well, the answers are here quite simply. Let me just hold them before you. The first cause of all this, according to the prophet here, is that man glories in and places his ultimate confidence in himself. That's the first cause of the trouble. That man glories in himself and puts his final confidence in himself and in his own powers. Now, you notice that Jeremiah uh, says, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Yes, but you notice it is his wisdom. He's not so much glorying in the wisdom or in the might, or in the riches, as the fact that they're his, that they belong to him, that they're a part of him, that he possesses them. In other words, the radical trouble and the cause of all our ills is this fatal self-confidence of men. Man has always believed, since he went wrong and departed from God, that he could deal with the problems of life and of his world. He 
he's quite confident that he needs no help. This is, according to the Bible, man's essential trouble. He feels that he is autonomous, doesn't need anything outside himself, doesn't need a god, doesn't need a lawgiver. He's autonomous. He is self-sufficient. And because he feels that he's autonomous and self-sufficient, he is always self-satisfied. In other words, he believes that by the exercise of his own powers and his own abilities, he can cope with the situation, he can deal with the problem, and he can solve it in a satisfactory manner. So he looks at himself, and he glories in himself. And he is proud of his powers. Now, that's the word the, uh, that the prophet uses. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. He does glory in it. He's proud of it. And this is typical of the modern man. Never has man been more proud of his own wisdom than he is at this present hour. He's arrived, he thinks. He's got knowledge. He's got learning. He's got understanding such as no previous generation has ever had. And he's proud of it. The modern man is tremendously proud of his own learning and wisdom and understanding. He glories in it and in his power and the way he's able to use and to handle power and in his riches and in his wealth. He glories in it. He looks at himself and these things that he possesses and he boasts of it. He's proud of it. He glories in it. He exults in it. And, of course, he places a final confidence in it. Now that, I say, is the essential cause of all men's troubles. It's a very subtle one. And it's a subtle one for this reason. That there is value in these things in which men glorious. Well, where is the trouble then? Oh, the trouble is this. That man doesn't use them properly. He doesn't regard them in the right way. The trouble is that man, in his blindness as the result of sin, turns into absolutes what are really only relative. Or if you prefer it, he makes masters of what were meant to be servants. Now that's the trouble. Now let me show you what I mean. Take wisdom. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Well, does that mean, says somebody, that there's anything wrong with wisdom? Is it a part of the preaching of the Christian faith to say that wisdom is no good? That a man has to commit intellectual suicide? That a man has to throw all his books overboard or burn them? And that the ignoramus is really the man whom God delights in? Does Christianity put a premium upon ignorance and darkness and lack of knowledge? Well, of course it doesn't. Well, what's wrong, you say? Well, what's wrong is this. Wisdom in and of itself, wisdom stands for knowledge and for learning, the ability to think and all these things. Wisdom in and of itself is a most noble and a most excellent thing. God has given men the gift of reason. It's a part of God's self. It's a part of God's image in men that he has this ability to think and to reason and to sift evidence and to weigh and to measure and so on and to arrive at decisions and to consider himself. Wisdom is a most wonderful thing and a most excellent thing. And of course, the whole story of civilization is in a sense the story of the men using and employing this gift of wisdom which God has given him. Now, all this is perfectly right. And all the best benefits that we are enjoying in this life and in this world tonight have come to us as the result of this wisdom. It is by using his brains and knowledge and understanding that man has been able to discover so many of the secrets of nature, has been able to harness them and turn them to his own advantage and to his own good. And everything about that is absolutely right and good. It's the same with great literature, great art, great music. All these things are excellent in and of themselves. Well, what's wrong then, says someone? Well, you see, what's wrong is this. That instead of using wisdom in that way as our servant and as something that can give us many benefits and help us in so many ways, man has turned wisdom into a kind of God. He puts his faith in wisdom. He worships wisdom. He glories in wisdom. He says, my wisdom is enough. He's dominated by his own wisdom. He bows down before it. He glories in it. In other words, he has turned what was meant to be a servant into something that has become a master. It's exactly the same thing 
with the, this strength or this might to which he refers. There's no need to waste your time over this. It is because of this might and this power that men again has been able to do uh, so many wonderful things. Here again is something that comes out in the great record of history. The mighty things that have been done. Well, it's all right. It's a God-given power and faculty. Well, what's wrong? Well, it's exactly the same thing once more. That men worships it. Most of it. Nearly all the great empires that history has ever known have done this very thing. Having achieved a certain position, they begin to bow down to themselves and to worship themselves. There's a great illustration of it in the Old Testament. A man called Nebuchadnezzar. He thought he was a god. He began to worship his own might and power and wisdom. He was a very great man. But the moment he begins to worship it, he becomes a fool. Now that's what man's doing. Let's be honest, this country has done it in the past. That's what they're doing the other side of the Iron Curtain tonight. The strong, they're holding up their mailed fist. They're threatening. That's worshipping might and power. And it's done by men in almost every realm and department of life. Individuals do it. They use their power. Power is a good thing, but once you let it become a master, it's a terrible thing. It's like fire. Fire is a good servant, but a bad master. Look what you can do with fire. Heat your house, warm your hands, cook your meals. Fire is an excellent servant. But you let your house get on fire, and fire becomes master. And it always leads to catastrophe and devastation. And it's exactly like that, with all might and power that is given to men and that is known of men. Most of the troubles in the world tonight are due to this. You see, there was a time when all the power was in the hands of the masters, and the men had no power, and they groveled, and it was tyranny, it was unfair, but we're beginning to witness the exact opposite today, direct action, forcing governments and countries to do certain things. Why? Well, because they've got the whip end, as they think. Whenever power becomes the master, it is quite wrong, and to glory in power, and to rely upon your power, and to think there's nothing like your power, it always leads to calamity. And exactly, of course, the same is true of riches. Money is a very useful commodity, and you can do many things with money, and with wealth, and with riches. There's nothing wrong in the thing itself. But it becomes wrong when men begin to worship it, when they begin to rely upon it, when they begin to think that there's nothing it cannot do, Money is power, and a man feels that because he's got this wealth, there's nothing he cannot do. He relies, he glories in it, he boasts of it, places his final confidence in it. That's the thing that is denounced. And that is how I say, you see, the subtlety of all this. That man has turned the servants into masters, or has allowed the servants to become masters, and they dominate him and they control him. And here he is fondly imagining that all is well. He says, there are troubles, what's it matter? My wisdom. There are troubles, doesn't matter, my might's going to see me through. What's it matter? I'll buy my way through this. My wealth is going to do it. That's the tragedy. And now that is in various forms and ways. The whole essence of the human tragedy at this very moment this evening. Can't you see it operating on all levels? Between countries, between blocks of countries within countries, in the various divisions, capital and labor, and all these things. Oh, the havoc that is in the world tonight, because men, in some way or another, are glorying in wisdom or might or riches. That's the first cause of the trouble. It's all a form, as I'm indicating, of men's self-adulation, self-worship, autonomous men, men self-sufficient. Man's got all that's necessary. And with these powers, he's going to solve the problem. There is the essence of the trouble. But let me put this in a second form. It is, I say, because men in that way glories in himself and puts his final confidence in himself, that he gets himself and his world into trouble so constantly, then, now, always. But that, you see, indicates a second thing. That man clearly fails to realize his own inadequacy and his own inability and the consequent insufficiency of these very things on which he tends to rely. Now here is the urgent matter. This is, I say, the cause of the trouble. 
It's tragic tonight. To me, this is the greatest tragedy of all. It's much a greater tragedy, you know, than the fact that they've got those bombs. This is the tragedy. That anybody should be relying on such things. Or relying that they are able to deal with that problem in some shape or form, in and of themselves. That's what they do. Now, what I say is truly amazing is this. That it is at all possible for anybody to do that at this present hour. Now, they were doing it in Israel of old. Though everything had gone wrong and the enemy was coming, they still trusted in these things and the prophet has to warn them. Isn't this a part of men's essential blindness as the result of what the Bible calls sin? Man goes on trusting in himself and in his own powers and in his own ability in spite of the great lesson of history. What is the great lesson of history? It's this. It is the failure of doing this very thing. There is history proclaiming how foolish this is. There are all the biographies attesting the same thing. But still man goes on believing in it. But still more astonishing is this. That in spite of the fact that the world is as it is tonight, man is still relying upon these very things. Even now, on the brink of the inferno, on the brink of final calamity, men are still trusting to these things. Here in this mid-twentieth century, with the world going in flames, as it were, tonight round and about us, man still is putting his faith into these things. It's almost incredible. Why does he do so? Well, I say there's only one answer. It is because he doesn't realize the true nature of the problem confronting him. It's because he's never awakened to the inadequacy of the things to which he trusts. Listen, thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Why? Well, because they're inadequate, because they're insufficient. Because they cannot solve the problem. Are we clear about that? These people were not clear. I suggest the world is not clear tonight. Are you clear, my friend? Well, let's look at them one by one. Take wisdom. Don't glory in your wisdom, says God. Why not? Wisdom, surely, says someone, is an excellent thing. Well, I've agreed, it is. It's a wonderful gift. It's the highest gift that man has. And I'm not here to disparage it or to say a word against it in any shape or form. But I am here to say that if we glory in it and trust in it and rely upon it, we are nothing but fools. Why? Well, because of the obvious limits to wisdom. Because of the things that wisdom cannot do. What is it that wisdom cannot do? Well, here are some of the things it can't do. And they're the most important things in life. Wisdom can discover many secrets of the universe and can harness them. It can bring in its wonderful inventions. It can make life much more comfortable and much easier for all of us. All right, excellent. But you know, here's the sort of thing that wisdom can't do. It can't enable a man to know himself. Now, that was the great phrase of the philosophers, the people who believed in wisdom above everybody else, those Greek philosophers to whom Paul was referring in writing there in his epistle to the Corinthians. They were the philosophers, the believers in wisdom. And this was the great word of the philosophers. Know thyself. They said that's the most important thing in the world, is for a man to get to know himself. And they were absolutely right, of course. But here's the tragedy. That their philosophy couldn't enable a man to do that. Philosophy is very good at posing questions, and the questions need to be posed. Yes, but you and I, we don't want simply to get people to pose questions to us. What you and I need to know is the answer to the question. Know thyself. And this is the tragedy, that philosophy cannot answer that question. It doesn't know. Ask your great philosophers tonight, what is man? And they don't know. They don't know about the true nature of men. They don't know about the essential greatness of men. They think he's just an animal who's developed a little more cerebrum than the other animals. That's their view of men. And it's because they think things like that that the world is as it is. The philosophers tell us that we're all but animals. They shouldn't be surprised, therefore, if most people are behaving like animals. They're encouraging them to do so. They say that a man has got these 
drives within him these desires, well, they're obviously there for some purpose and they're meant to be used. Why shouldn't he use them? Very well, people are listening to them and they're using them, hence the chaos in life. And the philosophers themselves, many of them, are doing the same thing and are even giving a lead in that respect. Always check what a philosopher teaches by his life and by his record. It's very illuminating. They don't understand men. They don't know men's true and essential greatness. They don't likewise know man's real object and purpose in this world. What's he here for? And they don't know. You read their books. Life to them is just an accident. It all started as an accident. There's no plan, they say. There's nothing here at all. Things just happen. Man's just something that's happened. Well, hasn't he got a great destiny? Not at all. He lives here and has all these troubles. He dies. That's the end of it. And on and on it goes. There's no purpose, there's no object. Philosophy, wisdom can't tell you about man and his own greatness and glory and the purpose of life and living and existence. And in the same way, it doesn't know man's real need. They think his need is to have more knowledge, more learning, more understanding, more scientific inventions. Well, we've had a great number, haven't we, in this present century, but things far from getting better seem to be getting worse. What is man's need? They don't know. And in any case, you see, when they say more knowledge, more learning, so many of us haven't got the brains to take it in. What's to happen to us? No answer. Nothing at all. Nothing for the poor. Nothing for the ignorant. Nothing for those who don't understand the categories and the terms of their brilliant philosophies. Nothing. Emptiness. Bankruptcy. You see, wisdom can't supply this great need. But not only that. Wisdom doesn't even give us an explanation of uh, why the world is as it is tonight. Isn't that one of the first things we want to know? Why is the world as it is? And your wisdom, your human philosophy can't tell you. It doesn't know. It has argued and argued very loudly for a hundred years that if only you educated people more and if only you made them travel more and meet one another more that there'd never be war any longer. That war was due to ignorance and people not meeting with one another. The more we meet together, the more we love one another. The more we know, the more we'll banish war. We've done the exact opposite. They don't understand. They really don't know what's the matter with the world tonight. They're baffled and utterly bewildered. They think it's madness. So wisdom fails there again. Not only that, you see, wisdom doesn't help us at all in this whole problem of personal living, personal daily life. What are the problems? Well, my friend, your main problems in this world and mine are these. How to live a clean, a pure, an honest, and an upright life. How to resist temptation and evil. How to maintain a certain chastity with which you were born. These are the problems. And here wisdom doesn't help you at all. The Apostle Paul has said the final word about this in the seventh chapter of his great epistle to the Romans. With my mind, he says, I delight in the law of God. But I find another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. Yes, I know what I ought to do and I even want to do it, but I can't do it. I'm paralyzed by something else. Your wisdom doesn't help you. Tell the people, they say, about the evil effects of drink and they'll stop drinking, do they? Give them instruction on morality and venereal disease and they'll be moral, will they? Does knowledge deliver? Of course it doesn't. Some of the men who impart the knowledge are the greatest slaves to the very things against which they're warning us. To know that a thing is bad doesn't stop a man doing it. Wisdom is excellent as far as it goes, but it can't solve this moral problem. The philosophers have been some of the greatest failures. That's why you shouldn't glory in wisdom. It fails to deal with all the greatest and most fundamental problems of life. Take another to know God. The world by wisdom knew not God. It had tried very hard before Christ came. Your greatest philosophers had all come and gone before the birth of Christ. And they'd got, oh, they'd got a long way. Let me give them that credit. But they hadn't got there. They didn't know him. He was an unknown God. And all your wisdom and knowledge will never bring you to this. He's beyond it. He's above it. And it doesn't teach us how to face the end of all things and how to die. Human wisdom knows nothing about death, doesn't understand it. 
It just has to turn its face to the wall and go out as best it can. Its highest achievement was stoicism, a kind of courage, a manly courage, though you don't know, but that's no solution. That's resignation, that's giving in, that's really just putting up with things. That's no solution. Well, now, you see, without my keeping you further, here are some of the reasons why you shouldn't glory in wisdom. Isn't it sheer madness that the world tonight should be trusting to its own wisdom and knowledge and understanding when it patently cannot deal with the vital problems, the most urgent matters that are before us? And exactly the same is true about might. What do you mean, says someone? Well, again I say that might in and of itself is quite all right, but when a man begins to glory in it, he just shows that he's a fool. A very wise man wrote a book of Proverbs, which is in the Old Testament, and he said a thing like this. He says, Greater is he that controlleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. He says, A man who can control his own temper is a greater man than the man who conquers another city and captures it from an enemy. Why? Well, you see, this is something that history surely should have shown to us very plainly. What is there greater than might? Well, there are many things I suggest to you which should persuade us not to put our final confidence in might. What is history? Well, in a way, it's nothing but a great fight between brains and brawn. And you see, we are living in an age when we are seeing this increasingly. There was an age when men used to fight their battles personally and personal chivalry and valor and courage counted tremendously. In an age in which you fight by pressing buttons, that doesn't help very much, does it? It's cleverness you need now, it's ingenuity, it's inventive capacity. It's the men who can get that rocket first. Brains against brawn. And so your great massive battleships are obsolete. With all their power, they're absolutely useless. One man presses a button, that's the end of your great mighty dreadnought. Brains against brawn. I'm putting it in modern language. The Bible puts it in the story of David against Goliath. This colossus that stood defying the armies of the living God. He take them all on together. And this stripling of a boy comes with just a sling and a stone. And one of them finishes the great mighty power. Brains against brawn. What a fool is the man who trusts in might and who glories in it. Quite apart from that, of course, it's something that gets less and less as you get older and older. All power tends to wane and to vanish and to disappear appear. every day. You're older, you've got that much less energy and vital power and ability. Not only that, it's attacked by various forces. Illness comes and your strong man is thrown down in utter helplessness and weakness. The thing is laughable. Look at that strong man. And I'm told there's a little virus which is so small that you can't see it under the most powerful microscope. It's ultra-microscopic. It's so small that it passes through the most delicate filters that man has ever made. The virus of influenza. And yet when it attacks that giant of a man, it knocks him down as if he were nothing. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. There are powers and forces that can come along and suddenly smite him, and it's all gone. And think of the other things that arise. Isn't this again the story of history? Look at the great, mighty, all-conquering nation. Yes, but it doesn't last very long, does it? Read your Old Testament history, my friends. It's very salutary. It does us a lot of good. You'll see great empires coming up one after another, thinking that at last they were the world conquerors, and they'd remain there. But another suddenly comes up, and down they go. He does the same thing. Down he goes. Read the book of Daniel and you'll see them falling like nine pins. This is the story of the nations, the empires. There are these powers that come and attack the mightiest and the strongest and in a spiritual sense, don't you see it? What's the power of talking about and glorying in your might when you realize there is one called the devil, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, you are but putty in his hands. You are nothing. And then think, my friend, of pitting yourself against the power of God. The almighty everlasting God. You say, I don't believe in this nonsense. I'm going through life on my feet, are you? You're pitting yourself against the rock of ages. You're standing up against the God of the universe. And your might is nothing. But then I say, 
I remind you again when you think that you're strong and are glorying and bursting in your might and power. Look at that specter that is approaching with a scythe in his hand. Who is he? He's death. Wielding his scythe and slaying men. All conditions and kinds. The power of death. Let him that is mighty not glory in his might. And it's exactly the same with riches. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Why? Money's power, says the world. Is it? Is money really power? Oh, up to a point I know it is. It can do many things, but there are some things it can't do. Here are some of them. Money is a very powerful and a very useful commodity, but it can't buy happiness. It can't buy peace. It can't even buy health. It can't buy wisdom. It can't buy love. It can't buy true life. Have you read the confessions of the, of the book about the wealthiest men in the world tonight? The wealthiest man in the world, but what a poor man. He can't find love. He's been married five times. He can't find married love, he says. He admits it. Glorying in your might, what's in your money, what's the point of it? It can't buy the most precious, the most wonderful thing in life apart from this gospel. The love of a person. Married bliss. The enjoyment of a home life. To be surrounded by your family. It knows nothing about it. It can't purchase it. And the same, I say, with peace and with health and all these things. And then again, there are the same dangers. Listen to our Lord on this. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, he says, where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal. There are these corroding influences. What do you like if you lose your money? If you've been living on it, what have you got left? But there are always these things that are threatening you, and you never know when they come, and the things that you buy are of no value to you in the hour of trial. And that brings me to the last trial. In this modern atomic world, what's the value of wealth? Is there any difference between the wealthiest men in the world and the poorest men in the world? When that button is pressed and that bomb goes off, there's none at all. No difference whatsoever. Face to face with death in the end, money is valueless and useless. Let me put it again in the words of our Lord. What shall it profit a man though he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Oh, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? He says, here's my wealth, here's my bank balance, here are my possessions. No good. It can't do instead of the soul. It's of no value. What shall it profit a man? Nothing. Nothing at all. Here yeah, then I say is men's second manifestation of his tragic folly. That he doesn't realize the nature of his problem. He is relying on things that are totally inadequate to help him at that point. His self-confidence is utterly misplaced. His reliance upon his faculties is something that is nothing but sheer folly and tragic folly. They're inadequate to meet the greatest needs. But come to the third and the last point. Man's final trouble is this. His failure to know and to trust God and to glory in him alone. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Oh, I say, here is man's Real trouble. That he doesn't know God, that he doesn't rely on God. My dear friend, this is the whole cause of the tragedy of human history. It started like this, didn't it? You see, the world was not always like this. The world was once perfect. And man was perfect. And he was living a life of bliss and of joy and of peace and of happiness. 
Well, what's gone wrong? This is what's gone wrong. That man ceased to glory in God and began to glory in himself. He began to glory in his own wisdom. You shouldn't remain like this, said the tempter to Eve, and she believed him. You ought to trust yourself, he said. You ought to rise up and assert your own wisdom and your own knowledge. You shouldn't say that you have no right to eat any one particular fruit. You have a right to everything. Trust yourself. Express yourself. Be yourself. And they did it. Instead of glorying in God and relying upon him, they began there to rely upon themselves and to glory in themselves. And down they went, and the world has been down ever since. And the world is as it is tonight because of this. But God, in his infinite mercy, still calls us to listen. Thus placed as we are at this moment, thus saith the Lord. He hasn't given us up. He hasn't turned his back upon us. He's still pleading with us. Listen, he says, listen. Don't... Trust in your wisdom. Don't trust in your might. Don't trust in your riches. If you want to trust, if you want to glory, if you want to boast, glory in this. Well, what is it? Well, the first thing is that he understandeth me. If you want something to glory in, says the Lord God himself, it is this. Glory in the fact that you understand me. Well, what does that mean? Well, that I am the Lord. Here's the thing to glory in. That over and above our troubled, tragic world tonight is the one who originally made it. We are not left to ourselves. God is over all. I am the Lord. From eternity to eternity, all-powerful, the everlasting God the God who made everything, the universe, man himself, and he's above, he's over all. He's not involved in these tensions and strivings and strains. He's above it all. He dwelleth in a light that is unapproachable in, in eternity, in that high and lofty place. He's there. Get to know this is God. So that when you've looked around you and see no hope and feel yourself failing and everything going against you, lift up your eyes unto the hills, lift beyond them, look at the creator of the hills, God, away above the flux of time and history, eternal in the hymns, the everlasting creator. This is the thing to glory in, but wait. That I am the Lord which exercise judgment and righteousness in the earth, what does he mean? He means this. He exercises judgment and righteous in, righteousness in the earth. He's still doing it. He is a righteous and a holy God. He has given his laws for men and for life, and we are meant to obey them. And he's concerned that we should. He interferes in life. That's the whole record of this history. Maintaining this righteousness. Yes, but he's a God of judgment. He not only has told us what we are to do, he expects us to do it. He holds us responsible if we haven't done it. He is the judge, a righteous, a just judge. He demands righteousness. Now, this is the thing the world needs to know tonight. Over and above the bombs and what they may do is the certain fact of death, bombs or not, and beyond death, God and judgment and justice and righteousness, we've all got to stand before him. We've no right to live as we like and as we please and as we choose. It is wrong to say every man for himself. Let a man express himself and do what he likes. No, no. God is there and we're all under him and we'll all stand in his presence and be judged in the light of his holy law. I am the Lord that exercise righteousness and judgment in the earth. Get to know this. If only the whole world knew this tonight, everything would be changed. If only all these earthly powers and individuals realized that they're responsible to God and that they've all got to die. Your Kennedys and Khrushchevs and all their peoples and all their armies, they've all got to die and answer God if they only realized it, how differently they'd behave. And so would we all in our individual capacities. You wouldn't go on condemning and hating that person if you knew we were to stand before God. You wouldn't judge another if you knew that you were to be judged. You wouldn't do that unrighteous thing and think you're clever because nobody's seen you. God's seen you. 
Everything is naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Understand this, he says, and then you'll have a new view of life. Not only that, and thank God for this other word. Let him glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth that I am the Lord which exercised judgment and righteousness in the earth. Yes. And loving kindness also. Loving kindness. I wouldn't have preached to this point if I didn't know that I was coming to the world, word loving kindness. All I've said is needs to be negative. It's all condemnation. I wouldn't have started if I didn't know that this glorious word was coming. Loving kindness. Get to know this, says God. In your trouble, in your agony, in your pain, get to know that I am the Lord who exercise loving kindness in the earth. What does he mean? It means this, my dear friend. It's all here in symbolic manner on this table before me. The loving kindness of God. Not only justice and righteousness and truth, but loving kindness. Oh, he has the only hope for us at this moment. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That though we all deserve the punishment of hell and deserve it richly. That God has made a way to forgive us and to restore us. It's because of his loving kindness. It's nothing in us. We've defied him. We've rebelled against him. We've criticized him. We've deliberately gone our own way. We've brought ourselves into trouble and our whole world with us. And we deserve nothing. But he offers to forgive us freely. His loving kindness was so great that he sent his only son from heaven into this world. Not only to live and to teach and to give an example, but especially to die on the death of the cross. And what was he doing there? Taking the burden of your sins and mine upon himself. Taking our guilt upon himself. Bearing its punishment, its shame, its suffering, its agony. Dying that we might be forgiven, that we might live, that we might become the children of God. God's loving kindness. God so loved. That's it. It's the only hope. This is the thing to glory in. My wisdom can't save me. I'm involved in the world. Death is coming. I know not when. I can do nothing. My wisdom doesn't save me. My might doesn't save me. My money doesn't save me. I can do nothing. I'm guilty before God. What can I do? Well, here's the thing. This is the thing to glory in. In the cross of Christ I glory, towering o'er the wrecks of time. Oh, the light of sacred story gathers round its head sublime. God forbid that I should glory, says Paul, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified unto me, and I unto the world. The loving kindness of God. You needn't be lost. You needn't go to that condemnation, that perishing. It's offered you as a free gift. You only believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that he died for you and your sins and you're freely forgiven. My dear friend, this is the thing to glory in. Well, now he says you must understand these things. These, this is the thing to glory in, that you understand all that. That you see your position. You see what's coming, but you see what God's done. That you not only understand it, he says you must know it. Let him... But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. Now this word knoweth is very important. The word to know is used in the Bible invariably in this sense. It's a very strong word. It doesn't just mean knowing about. It means knowing in a very personal and in a very intimate manner. God says to the children of Israel through Amos, You only have I known of all the nations of the earth. That doesn't mean that he didn't know about the others. No, no, what it means is this. You are the only nation I've been interested in. You are the only ones I've known intimately. You have been my special people. No, no then, says the prophet, here it is. You must not only understand these things. You must know them. And 
And oh, what a difference there is here. There's a difference here, you know, between eternal death and eternal life. You say, yes, I've listened to you. I understand what you're saying. But my friend, I want you to go further. Do you know these things? Do you know what it is to experience them? I say you can be freely forgiven if you believe. Do you know that you are forgiven? I say if you believe you'll receive a new life and a new nature, you become a child of God. Do you know that you are a child of God? I say that you must understand that God is the Lord and that he's the judge and that nevertheless he has loving kindness. Do you know him? Do you really know these things? You see, a mere intellectual apprehension isn't enough. You must know it. You must know it intimately. You must know it personally. You must know it directly. This must become living and vital to you. It must become real to you. You must not only understand, you must know. Do you know these things? Well, says the prophet, if you understand and know these things, you are entitled to glory. Glory in this. Why? Well, because if you glory in this, you'll have had everything else that you need. If you begin to glory in God, in Christ, as he has revealed himself in Christ and him crucified, do you know what happens to you? You'll have a wisdom greater than that of the whole world put together. We, says the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians, have the mind of Christ. Christ is made unto us wisdom. The moment you believe this gospel and really get it and understand it, you'll understand yourself, you'll understand life, you'll understand why the world is as it is in a way you've never done before. You know, the Christian is not a bit surprised that the world is as it is. He expects it to be. He knows that the more men rely on themselves and turn their backs on God, the worse the world is going to get. So it has got worse. We have prophesied it would. And it will get worse until men turn back. We understand it. Yes, but not only that, you see, we can see through it. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We can see beyond it all. We can see the purpose of it all for the soul. We can see the glory that is coming when Christ returns. This is wisdom. Do you know it's a great thing to be a Christian in a world like this at this moment? The Christian really has an understanding of it all. He sees right through it, and he's the only one who does. He gets the very wisdom that he desired, the true wisdom, not his own wisdom, and he gets power, power to live. Power to live triumphantly. Power to conquer his old enemies, temptation, sin, and evil. Power to face all eventualities. He is not afraid because he knows that he's being kept by the power of God. He knows that he's safe in the hands of God. Ah, oh, he may have to suffer a lot in this world, in a physical sense and in other respects, but he knows that his soul is in safe keeping. He knows that all is well with his soul. He's got this power round and about him. The angel of the Lord, as I was quoting this morning, encampeth round about them that fear him. He knows that he's surrounded, that nothing shall finally harm him. The power of God unto salvation is in charge of him. And then think of the riches that he immediately possesses. He gets untold wealth and riches in this world. I don't know of anything that makes a man so rich as to understand something of the teaching of this book. I'd sell everything I've got many times over in order to understand this. Because here is everything that I need. Riches. Well, let me quote those wonderful words that we were singing just now. No good in creatures can be found but may be found in thee. I must have all things and abound, while God is God to me. He that has made my heaven secure will here all good provide. While Christ is rich, can I be poor? What can I want beside? He is the heir of the universe, and as a child of God, I'm a joint heir with him. Of his fullness of all we received, says John, and grace for grace. Here you can draw out of the rivers of his grace and feel your needs all being satisfied. Listen to the Son of God speaking. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves cannot break through and steal. Bank in the bank of heaven and your treasure is secure. Lay up for yourselves treasures there 
No bombs can touch them. No inferno can make any difference to them. Why, my friend, listen again to Paul writing to the Corinthians. What do you want, he says? Are you out for riches? All things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and ye are Christ's and Christ is God's. Are you out for riches? Well, listen to the Son of God again. Blessed are the meek. Why? Well, for they shall inherit the earth, the whole universe. Your little bank balance is a flea bite. It's nothing. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. If you believe this message, you become a child of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, who is the heir of all things, the whole universe. All things are yours. This is the thing to glory in. You get the wisdom you long for. You're given the might and the power and the strength that you covet. And you become the heir of riches that can be measured only in terms of the illimitable wealth and power and character of God himself. And yes, you glory in this for this reason, that you've not only got it now, but you'll always have it. Let them send off all their bombs in all countries at the same time. Let the universe be blown to nothing. It won't have the slightest effect upon this. This is the thing to glory in. Not in that earthly human wisdom that fails when you need it most of all. Not in that might and strength which are waning and disappearing and finally are defeated by the scythe of death. Not in riches which moth and rust can destroy and the thieves can take from you. Finally, again, the hand of death. Let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, the Lord of the universe. If you're in his hands, come what may, you're everlastingly and eternally safe. You can face life, you can face death, you can face all things, quietly, calmly, triumphantly, and confidently. You say, if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.